continuing on with the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to present Jennifer Schaefer Mary. Jennifer once dreamed of becoming the next Howard Carter and achieved a BA in Classical Archaeology from the University of Arizona. Later, due to her, both her passion for genealogy research and an opportunity to preserve a small family cemetery, she was inspired to pursue an MA in history with a concentration in public history. Prior to her current position as reference archivist at the Arizona Historical Society, she was the news content coordinator for the State of Arizona Research Library, where she managed an extensive newspaper collection and co-wrote an accepted NEH grant. She chairs the Arizona chapter of the Association for Gravestone Studies and sits on boards for several local museums, genealogy, and lineage societies. She speaks on cemetery preservation, symbolism, and law reform, incorporating these and the GPS, which stands for the Genealogical Proof Standard, in the Genealogy Research Methods Practicum she teaches at ASU's History Master's Program. When she isn't working at AHS or on her own or other people's genealogy, volunteering, teaching, or with her husband and many pets, she also writes fiction. In today's presentation, she's gonna be talking about cemetery symbolism. So I'd like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you all for um, coming and listening to me talk today. So I usually do um, this talk with uh, one of my co-chairs with the Association for Gravestone Studies, Arizona chapter. Um, and uh, that we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are um, and, and why I think you should all join if you have an interest in cemeteries. Um, we are going to share, or I'm going to share, some symbols common to Arizona um, and also ones that you might see everywhere. Uh, I realize a lot of you folks are not um, from either Arizona or Nevada. You may be coming to us from somewhere else, but uh, hopefully this will still be relevant to what to what you see, or if you ever come to visit one of our great states, um, this will give you an idea of what you're going to see here, um, because we are a little bit different here in the desert. Um, so who we are, um, the Association for Gravestone Studies and the Pioneer Cemetery Association are the two hats I'm going to wear for this presentation. Um, and initially, um, the Association for Gravestone Studies is a, an, organiza an international organization that I've been a member of for several years. And when I started volunteering at the Pioneer Cemetery Association, I met Cindy Lee and Debbie Branning. Um, who also had the same idea as I did, that we needed an Arizona chapter for the Association for Gravestone Studies. Um, and they require three uh, people to start a chapter. So that's what we did. So we started our chapter in 2016. Um, and we are really passionate about cemeteries in general. But one of the things we love most about AGS, um, the Association for Grave Student Studies, is their mission, which is that they are dedicated to the study and preservation of grave markers. Simple as that. Um, we have members of the association from every field having something to do with cemeteries. And I think that's really my biggest love of looking into cemeteries is because you can have an interest in anything, archaeology, art, conservation, genealogy. There's so many ways you can come to loving being in a cemetery. And I love that we can bring all of these people together um, as part of this organization. We have uh, conferences every year um, in June, um, and it is uh, held wherever uh, one of the chapters wants to have a conference. So first of all, we will probably never have a conference in Arizona because it is held at the end of June and no one wants to be here then. So um, at this point, we will maybe do something smaller than a full conference um, at some point, uh, but it's just too hot here for folks to come traipse through cemeteries in the, at the end of June. Uh, but I hope to do something here in the near future that will get some folks out here and maybe in the winter time to look at our cemeteries. Um, the Pioneer Cemetery Association, which is how I kind of got started in uh, cemeteries, um, is also over a local cemetery, our oldest cemetery in Phoenix, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, our oldest cemetery in Phoenix is the Pioneer and Military Memorial Park, which is actually seven cemeteries uh, combined into one park area. And uh, it was uh, established in the 1860s and it closed in 1914. It is and still remains today the only public cemetery in the city of Phoenix, which as some of you may know, Phoenix, Arizona is the seventh largest city 
in Arizona, or I mean, in the country, and we only have one public cemetery, and this one is closed. So it's very interesting to me that that the dynamics within the cities in Arizona and how they treat um, their cemeteries. But uh, our cemetery is uh, kept up. It's a, owned by the city of Phoenix. Um, it is maintained by our cemetery association. Um, and we also uh, try to be the authority on most of the cemeteries in Arizona and uh, do what we can to help keep keep and preserve those cemeteries and give the information out to people that are looking for it on our cemeteries. So why am I here today? Um, why are you all here today? Well, we're here because cemeteries mean something to us. Um, and no matter what they look like, whether they're a lush green space or a desert cemetery like our Pioneer Military Memorial Park, cemeteries are outdoor museums. They're educational, they're informative. There's a lot of things that you can learn from them. We as genealogists know, of course, there's lots of things you can learn in a cemetery, but maybe I can tell you something that you don't already know. Obviously, you're going to learn names and dates uh, more than likely from the deceased person. Sometimes you can learn their occupation. Um, that could be revealed either in a symbol or written on the stone. It can be a couple different ways, or it could be um, possibly in the area that they're buried. There's lots of things you can learn um, by not just looking at one uh, mon monument, looking at multiple uh, cemetery or multiple burials within the cemetery. Um, you can learn the cause of death. Uh, some stones will give you a whole list of reasons this person died. Um, and there's a wonderful uh, person in the Association for Gravestone Studies that I've gotten to be friends with. And she, this is what she researches when we're out in our cemeteries, causes of death. And then she has a great uh, PowerPoint presentation on it later. And I absolutely look forward to seeing those because there's some amazing causes of death that they really want people to know about. Um, you can learn family members. We know that as genealogists, uh, who's buried next to them uh, or with with them, you know, who's on that stone written with them. Is that a family member or is that someone else? Religious affiliation. Again, this can be shown not only on the marker with the symbols of a religious uh, organization, but it could also be in where they're buried. Are they buried in a Catholic cemetery, a Jewish cemetery? Um, obviously, those are clues to what that person was like when they were living. Um, their friends, associates, and neighbors. We know them as the fan club. Um, those folks, who's buried around them? Those people that are buried around them were part of that community usually. Um, those can be clues. If you're stuck on your person, take a look around who's buried near them. Um, economic status. If you take a look at the uh, stone in this photograph, that was not cheap. Um, that was a very elaborately carved and in a very expensive marker to be placed for this person. Now, it doesn't mean that they paid for it themselves. They could have been a member of a, an organization that paid for it for them. But it does give you an idea of possible economic status um, because it is pretty elaborate. So take a look at these things and think about what other information you can get from your cemeteries. Um, and broader societal information. Um, as a former archaeologist, this is something that I like to look at because the layout of your cemetery can give you a lot of clues. Did they bury folks in years? You know, are all the 1970 de deaths over here? Are the 19 or the 1870 deaths over here? Or did are you buried in a plot that you bought? The the larger layout of the cemetery can give you clues to the the society that they lived in um, and and more information about your person. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what is unique in Arizona, because like I said earlier, we are very different than what you have back east or in other places. And I'm originally from southern Arizona. Um, and but I've been living in central Arizona for probably the last 30 years. So um, I'm more familiar with our Arizona cemeteries, but with the AGS and when I have time, that's what I do for fun is travel to visit other cemeteries. So I have examples in this presentation from travels as well as what I'm familiar with here in central Arizona. I am not a hundred percent expert on cemetery symbolism because there, I don't think anybody could be um, an absolute expert on absolutely everything because there are just so many different unique things that you can find in cemeteries and, and as symbols on a grave marker. 
Um, anyway, so I'm going to show you some of our travels and some of these images that you see here are going to be from my collection, my partner's collection uh, with uh, the Association for Gravestone Study. Some of them are going to be internet images just to illustrate what I'm talking about. All right, so we are a desert here in Arizona, in case you weren't aware. Um, uh, it's a little hot in the summertime and we don't have a lot of big bushy plants here. It's desert landscape. Um, and most of our cemeteries, we try to keep to the desert landscape because of the water issues that we have here. Now, a lot of our um, cemeteries do have lots of trees um, and things like that, but most of the time they're not going to be the, the heavy water drinker trees that you see here. But we're a desert. So these photos right here are from the 1950s and 1960s. The one on the left is the Maricopa County Cemetery, uh, which was a burial for indigent and the, um, and the poor. And the one on the right is from the 60s, I believe, and it is the Pioneer Military Memorial Park that I have talked about. You can see very, very desert landscape. We here in Phoenix, um, when folks came here, they weren't used to that desert landscape. This is what they were used to. This is Mount Auburn in, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, which you're not, if you're not aware, it was the first rural cemetery. So Mount Auburn was established in 1831, and it was a solution to that problem of overcrowding of cities and overcrowding of cities of the dead. Those family plots on farms and things like that and the city cemeteries were in disrepair and they were getting pretty uh, dirty and folks were worried about disease and things like that. And so Mount Auburn was gonna be this lush and gorgeous cemetery that was not only clean, but it was also a place that the living could come and commune with the dead. Um, it was modeled after Père Lachaise, which was in France, and it was the first European ornamental cemetery. So you've got the aesthetic as well as the feeling that this is a cleaner place and a, a nicer place for people to come. It's a place where you would want to go rather than you bury your dead and then you move away. Here in Phoenix, though, we didn't really get the memo about this um, because we are such a new state. We didn't get the memo until the 1900s. And it wasn't until around 1906 that we put together our own sort of, I don't call it a rural cemetery, even though it is greener than Pioneer Military and Memorial Park, but Greenwood was meant to be more aesthetically pleasing. And it was so much uh, a place of beauty that people even took a lot of their burials out of the Pioneer Military and Memorial Park and moved them to Greenwood. And to illustrate that point, the handbook for the beginning of Greenwood said, to have Greenwood Cemetery lead all others in point of beauty and artistic taste has been the ambition of the present board of trustees. And this is the feeling going on at this time everywhere, in all cities, in all states, they wanted their places of burial to be beautiful. So I'm just gonna run through real quick the types of marker, markers we have here in Arizona because you're gonna see these in other places. And the reason I'm doing this um, is because it depends on the type of stone that the marker is made of, what type of symbolism you're going to get. Because if the marker is made out of things like adobe, brick, or concrete, you're not going to get much carving because the material is not made for carving, it's too hard, um, adobe is too soft. So things like this um, you may not have thought about when you're in a cemetery. What is that marker made of? And is that maybe why I don't have an elaborate carving on it? Or was it because it was um, the, a choice made by the person either burying the dead or the dead person themselves? So things to think about when you're wandering through your cemeteries. We also don't have a lot of the same, we may not have some of the same symbols as the folks back East um, because of the material that our markers are made out of. These are a few more that you'll see here in Arizona and I would suspect also in Nevada being a desert. Uh, wood was popular everywhere, uh, not just here, but we are also probably one of the few places that you can still see wood markers because they do not deteriorate as quickly as back East. Um, however, I will say that most of the wooden uh, markers that you're going to see either here or even back east were remade. So um, this example that I have here 
is likely not from 1903 or 1897. Um, these are probably done later. Um, I would say the 40s, uh, 1940s, or uh, maybe the 1980s. We had a couple iterations of our Pioneer Cemetery Association that did do some um, cleanup and some preservation here, and they may have been redone at that time. Um, I'm pretty sure these are not original, but we also know that these last longer than um, ones back east because even something replaced in the 1980s back east may not still be around because of the wet and damp uh, nature of the area. Anyway, so um, metal is another commonly used. You can't get too decorative with it. Um, nowadays, you probably can get a lot more decorative than back then because of machinery, um, but this is pretty uh, a typical marker that you might see in a cemetery here in the desert. And lastly, sandstone. Sandstone is something that we could provide here locally, but it's very, very soft. And unfortunately, a lot of folks, it's it's cheap. It was very inexpensive to use, but a lot of folks um, used it as the base to a marble or um, granite marker. And you can see it on the bottom photo, what happens when you do that, the, or the sandstone is going to crush. So we have a lot of that in our cemeteries. Um, it's also very soft, so you can't get too, too, too ornate with it. These are the most common markers that you're going to see just about everywhere. Marble, limestone, and granite. Marble and granite are the most popular, and today granite is even more popular um, for modern mar monuments and things like that. Um, it's easy to carve, and even today with granite, and laser carving, it's even easier to, to um, work on. Uh, limestone is also a very uh, soft and porous material, but it lasts longer than sandstone um, because of the uh, composition. Uh, but limestone, you will see some very, very ornate, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the organizations that use limestone um, for their monuments in a little bit. Or you might find something that's called white bronze or zinc. We have one in our cemetery in Phoenix, um, so I like to talk about that. Most of our markers here in Arizona were not manufactured here. Like I said, sandstone is probably the only material that was local. Um, we did have some granite quarries um, up north in northern Arizona, but we find that the majority of folks were bringing their uh, monuments in from somewhere else. Now, white bronze um, was only manufactured by the Monumental Bronze Company in Connecticut, so it would be shipped out here, but it was very easy and inexpensive because it could be shipped in parts and then just assembled by the undertaker at the, at the place of burial fairly easily. And it could be ordered in any way you wanted. You could put all kinds of symbols on it. Um, you could make it as tall as you wanted. Um, and it just needed to be uh, glued together in the, the pieces that were sent. Um, so it was easy. It was inexpensive. But unfortunately, it didn't last. Uh, the trend didn't last very long. And people went back to, very quickly went back to stone monuments. Like I said, most of the stuff in Arizona was not uh, manufactured here. Most people chose to buy their monuments from the Sears and Roebuck catalog. If you weren't familiar with that, you could just buy your monument um, out of a catalog, however it came pre-done, and have your name um, and dates carved in by your undertaker, and you could have it shipped out by uh, train, and it was easy peasy, and you could get it for as, get one for as low as $9. Um, and here is an example of some of the ones in our cemetery at the Pioneer Military Memorial Park uh, from the Sears catalog. So you can see here, uh, most of them are fairly uh, not very ornate, just a few little symbols. You know, maybe they picked one symbol that they liked and and called it good and that would work. And they're but they're still a very nice representation of the the dead person in the cemetery. All right. So I'm gonna talk about symbolism now, which is why you all are sitting here. So um, this is a Puritan marker. Um, it is my co-chair uh, partner's uh, favorite. Um, she likes to talk about Susanna Jane. I don't remember much about uh, the person who's buried with this marker, but I will tell you that symbolism on headstones was an expression of art. So you had these very beautiful artistic representations um, that you see here as in the Puritan era, but it was also part of the ritual of mourning. Um, so this, uh, headstones were not always just for the dead. They also were for the living. Um, sometimes they were stories. So um, in the 1700s and early 1800s, when 
folks didn't know how to read. They told a story and the, and it's something that everyone could learn about visually rather than uh, an entire written story somewhere. They could um, know what's going on through uh, visual. Um, but symbols could mean a lot of different things. So I'm going to tell you just a, about a few different categories of symbols that I know of. Angels. So angels were typically a religious symbol, um, but not always. Uh, they're found in many uh, religions, not just Christianity. You're also going to find angels um, in lots of different places because of the symbolism of uh, death. And there's lots of different types of angels that represent death. Uh, the one we see here is a cherub. Um, cherubs and angels, but usually cherubs, are very common on the graves of children. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about um, children's graves here in a bit. You can see this was a three-year-old child here when you look at her dates. Um, you can see this cherub is also holding uh, a sleeping baby, and that is also very common um, to think of children as sleeping rather than being dead. And we'll, like I said, we're going to have a whole section on children's burials also. Um, another angel uh, is going to be the one on the left, who is actually the Virgin Mary, because she has the veil. Um, she is blessing the living uh, with her outstretched hands um, and over the dead and just keeping watch over the deceased. The one on the right with her hand up to her ear, she is listening for God's word um, and waiting to take the deceased home. In this one on the left, we have um, the uh, grief. It represents grief, mourning, and loss, but it's the mourning angel. Um, she's holding a laurel wreath, which symbolizes victory over death. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about plants. Um, the image on the right is temperance, the, the uh, Christian value of temperance. Uh, she has a water pitcher by her side. And she is raising her arms to uh, raise the dead towards heaven. Um, and there's some more wreaths on the base of her stone as well. This one is a really interesting marker in Connecticut. Um, it was built by a father for his daughter that died young. Um, and it depicts the theological virtues of faith, hope, love, and charity. Um, I believe you can see hope. Um, and she is the one... Uh, I believe Hope is the one facing us, and she's holding a basket of flowers. The one on the left is Charity. Um, she's touching her chest or nursing a baby. It's harder to see. Um, hopefully you can see my pointer right here. You can see that she's holding something. Charity is usually uh, shown nursing a child. Um, and in the center, the weeping angel again that you see here is, um, again, depicting a life cut short and uh, depicting uh, the father's grief over the loss of his child. This one's everybody's favorite. Um, she is the angel of death, and there's a lot of symbolism here. Um, you can see her face. Though she's weathered, she is supposed to look uh, a little more uh, stern than some of the angels that we've seen so far, um, and she is holding a staff, which is uh, separating life from death, uh, that's what that represents. Um, and she also represents, besides representing death, she also represents hope. Um, but she is a little more stern and uh, scary looking than some of the happier, more joyful representing hope um, and life eternal angels that we see. This one is another one that is a favorite that uh, my colleague Cindy took recently. Um, this one is uh, the Angel of Death again, and this monument, according to Cindy, is very, very large. You can actually, um, she has a couple other photos of people sticking their heads up underneath uh, the veil there and looking inside. So it's a very, very massive monument. Um, it's for a husband and wife. Um, they died a, one day apart, and you can see that flanking the Angel of Death are two closed books. Um, and those, we're going to talk about books, but the closed books represent a completed life. And this is in a cemetery in Brooklyn. So birds, let's talk about birds. There's a lot of birds imag um, imagery that you'll see in cemeteries. Uh, usually they de um, depict the souls 
departure to heaven or their flight to heaven, or they might be used as a symbol of resurrection. Um, and doves in Christian burials usually also represent Christ and the Holy Spirit, um, but they don't always have to represent religion. Um, for example, these two birds in flight that you see here, um, they again symbolize going to heaven. And in the image um, that we saw at the beginning, the Puritans tended to use just wings as their um, depiction of the soul going to heaven. And that actually comes from ancient Egypt. So you can see that throughout time, humans have always had some kind of fascination with death and resurrection and life eternal, um, because we've always had some kind of symbol to depict how we feel the soul uh, lives on. And just as a side note, you can, um, once you get really good at looking at these, you can sometimes tell just from photos what they're made out of. Other times you actually have to touch them. But the one on the left, um, Castaneda, is uh, another zinc. Um, so you, if you see close enough on this photo, you can see how it was put together once uh, the bronze, white bronze was brought into place. You can see some of the screws are missing. And this is another type of bird. Um, eagles and hawks actually usually uh, represent military service. Um, they can also represent some kind of heroism or valor. You know, if someone rushed into a burning building and saved a child and died, maybe they would get an eagle or a hawk. But typically it's uh, military service or um, firefighters uh, or police officers. Those are usually depicted by eagles and hawks crosses. I could probably spend the entire day just on crosses because there's over 300 variations. Um, we're going to talk about the Greek, the Latin, and the Celtic crosses in my photos. Um, so all of these are the Latin cross, and the Latin cross is uh, with the making a T. The Greek cross, the uh, center of the cross would be um, perpendicular to the um, main cross, so it would be more of an uh, a lowercase t, more so than these. These actually kind of look like Greek crosses, but the middle um, bar would be a lot lower in a Greek cross. Um, so these are Latin crosses. The one in the center uh, with the rays behind it on the cement marker, um, that is the rays of sun, which depicts God's glory. So again, a, re a resurrection symbolism. Um, the uh, one on the far right, you can't really tell in this photo, but the arms are uh, kind of pointed, and um, those depict the suffering of Christ on the cross. So um, more resurrection and Christian symbolism here. Uh, the one on the left is a folk um, Latin cross, and we're going to talk about folk art in a little bit. Um, it's on a cement stone with the rays again, um, the one in the center with the angled cross, um, the corners are pointed out towards the world. Um, and uh, it's tilted. So that is called a missionary uh, Latin cross. And it's also ivy wrapped. And we're going to talk about the meanings of ivy um, when we get to the plants. And again, on the right, you've got another glory cross. These are Celtic crosses, so um, Celtic crosses can symbolize either usually Irish, but Irish or Scottish descent. Um, a lot of folks will use them just to represent uh, what it meant to be Irish or Scottish to them. Um, but there are actual meanings to some of the symbols that you see here. Um, and the circle in the center um, represents either heaven and earth or earth and the moon unified. Um, and all of that comes again from the Celtic folk folklore. Hands, we've got some hands, lots of hands. Um, I've got some resources that I'll share at the end of this uh, that can give you all the things you ever wanted to know about the different types of hands. Um, there's an entire handout that this particular author gives, which I find really useful. Some of my favorites are um, these ones where you've got all these different uh, symbolism with uh, with different hands shaking and things like that. Um, so the one on the left is God welcoming the soul to heaven, um, shaking hands, bringing them to heaven, surrounded by another laurel leaf that represents victory over death. The one on the right um, 
you can see a little bit better. This one is a husband welcoming his wife. So uh, if you look at the dates, I would expect to see that the husband died first and the wife died second. And the reason you know this is because on the left, if you look at the cuff um, for the woman, you can see this is more of a feminine, uh, looks like a feminine blouse kind of thing. This looks more like a um, jacket and a masculine cuff here. And so this is on purpose um, to depict what I just said, that the husband is welcoming the wife to heaven. Um, now, if you've got the handshake on the right with the two fingers pointing down, you can again see this is more of a feminine cuff and this is more of a masculine cuff. But because his fingers are pointing down, the husband is welcoming his wife to heaven, but he's also indicating that he's a mason. Um, so the fingers pointed down is a Freemason symbol. And we're going to talk about some of their other symbols, too, as we go on. Um, the one on the left does not mean this person is going to hell. Um, this is a symbol of God's hand reaching down. Uh, sometimes it's open. Uh, in this case, it's clutching a broken chain, uh, which depicts that the life was cut short. Um, but you know it's the hand of God because you've got the stylized clouds right above it. Um, so... It doesn't always mean that uh, they're going to heaven. Sometimes that is God's hand reaching out to bring them home. Um, this one on the left is, uh, you've got another book, which uh, the life is cut short in the middle. Um, we're going to talk about books, but uh, the pages are marked uh, and the life was not finished. And again, the, hand, the finger pointing up is... Uh, bringing the soul to heaven. If it were two fingers, it would be a clergy member. You've also got some acorns, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, so lots of different symbols that you can find on some of these. The marker on the right is going to be um, rising to heaven again. You've got the hand pointed upward. Um, her other hand is on a um, on an urn on a, uh, on a pedestal and that is urns usually represent some kind of either mourning or eternal remembrance of the living people for that person and these are some of my favorites also so the one on the left is a really large monument here in, in phoenix in the greenwood cemetery and the clasped hands are praying for eternal light playing a plea to God for eternal life. So um, these ones being as absolutely huge as they are, I think they really had a, a very long prayer to God. They really wanted to get to heaven because it's a big monument. Um, the ones on the right um, are the Cohen hands. And it's uh, a Jewish tradition. If you are a descendant from the Cohen tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel, um, that you can have this symbol on here. And it's something that was ingrained in Leonard Nimoy, the actor that played Mr. Spock on um, the on Star Trek, which was one of my favorite shows as a kid. Um, and he incorporated that into his character. So this is more of a peace sign and a religious symbol um, for the Jewish tradition um, and that he incorporated into the show. And it's always kind of nice to see uh, that pe more people know about it than if you were just uh, seeing it in a grave in a grave marker. So I said we would talk about talk a little bit about folk art, and folk art can be so many different things. Um, and we just usually talk about it being homemade, um, but it can be it can mean lots of different things. It can be the grave goods that are placed on a marker. Um, it can be just a simple marker made from whatever they found nearby. It can mean um, just that the folks didn't have money or it could mean that they wanted to be a part of that burial and make it themselves rather than buying something manufactured so folk means a lot of different things to a lot of different um, cultures what we've got here are a couple of cement markers now i know i said that cement is usually not elaborately carved and these are pretty uh elaborate for what you can do with cement um but they are again homemade um the angel and the bells. Um, these are probably young people. Um, the rays of light, again, uh, for uh, the rays of heaven, um, maybe children. Uh, the bells can also symbolize uh, wedding, so husband and wife, things like that. 
um, one, the one on the far left, the first one there, uh, again, was just a, a simple carved piece of cement and surrounded by rocks. And I'm sure that means something to that community. And this was also another young person, it looks like 77 to 81. Um, earth shaking, I'm not sure what that means to them, but they're very personal. Uh, that's sort of the nature of the folk. It's very personal and you may not ever know what they were symbolizing if you're not a part of that community or if you weren't part of that family. Um, the one in the center was made out of leftover pieces of wrought iron and pieces that they found around the house. Uh, there is actually a marker to the left of it uh, that actually doesn't have anything on it. That was just the place marker when they buried the people. A lot of times you'll see a lot of these in the indigent burials uh, with no marker and just some rocks. And the marker, uh, the marker that I mean, um, just the, the placeholder from the uh, owners of the cemetery. The one on the far right is a bunny. Uh, bunnies were typically over children's uh, graves as well. And that's a pretty decent drawing, I would say, for being on concrete. Uh, this is also one of my favorites. This is in our cemetery in Phoenix. Um, this this is folk, folk art because it was uh, made by hand, but this actually was, I believe, created by a stone carver that was just starting out. But you can see on the side, her name is Kitty Quackenbush, and they sort of ran out of space to get the rest of her name on there and just kind of left it. And that is actually her marker. So either the family couldn't afford to buy another one or he didn't want to redo it or this was practice. I'm not really sure. But um, that it was definitely hand carved and maybe he needed a little more practice. This is some folk art. Again, this was um, a wagon wheel and some probably rebar from nearby. Just things that you can find around when someone dies, um, sometimes you don't have the time to have a marker made or this meant more to the person. I would say this person had horses and uh, was an equestrian and had a wagon or was a farmer, something of that nature. And these are some, uh, the one on the left again is a child. There's a cherub um, and a homemade cross on it. Um, and these two are from an African-American cemetery in Alabama. Uh, the one on the right uh, was um, another homemade, just carved out of stone, and they put a little heart on it. Um, I believe, if I'm thinking of the right one, this was a, a very old woman. She lived quite a long life here, um, which I thought was pretty cool. Children. Well, children is not the happiest subject. Um, usually, a, the death of a child is devastating. Many of the markers that you'll see that are done for children are very elaborate and it's more to help the living uh, with their grief than had much to do with the child themselves. You'll see a lot, a lot, a lot of um, lambs. Uh, the Lamb of God in religious iconography, he loved little children. Um, so lambs are very common. If you see a lamb, it's probably a child. Um, Another one that's common are cradles. The one on the left is made to represent a cradle that a, a child would have slept in or a baby would have slept in. Um, and that's to remind people, again, that they're sleeping. Um, most people want to remember their, that their child was at, was asleep and, and kind of put the idea of death out of their minds. You can see some um, cherubs up there also at the top. Um, the one on the right is an infant nursery. So in some cemeteries, you'll have entire areas for children. Uh, this particular was in that folk cemetery that we saw some of the other images from. Um, and it it's just a homemade area where maybe there was a, um, a, a disease that went through and killed a lot of children. Uh, so they'll often do that just to uh, put them all in one place. Um, this one's kind of unique. The seashell uh, is representing safety um, as the seashell um, or the oyster shell would would hold a pearl it's holding a precious child um, and the child again is depicted as sleeping um, the one at the bottom the shoes um, the shoes represent a life that's left behind and uh, we see that a lot uh, with baby children and you may be um, you might have your children's shoes uh, you've outgrown um, that will represent that you've grown up and uh, grown away from those baby shoes, but same in depth. 
<clears throat> military markers are pretty standard. Um, most of them are government issued. Uh, some of the wars have a little bit different, a few differences to them, and I'll just kind of run through that really quick. Um, we're all familiar, hopefully, with the Civil War. Um, my uh, you, or my Zoom background is uh, the same photo here. I took that in Arlington. It was a beautiful spring day, and that's just a, a beautiful, beautiful cemetery. Uh, but again, all you're going to see are these military government-issued stones. Um, so that is the standard layout of a military cemetery that is uh, owned and operated by a VA, uh, straight lines and rows that are organized. Um, but that is not the case in non-military cemeteries. Um, so our Pioneer Military Memorial Park has a few rows and several uh, Civil War veterans that are buried there, as well as some other wars. Um, but we are not quite this or uh, linear because we're not a military cemetery. We just happen to have some military folks buried there. So if you're familiar with the story of the Civil War um, and the the Union and the um, the Confederate uh, stones, you may have already heard the story, you know, you'll see the Union stones are rounded at the top with their shield engraved in the center, and they may or may not have uh, the Grand Army of the Republic Star that you see in the ground in this photo. They may have it next to the stone like this, or it could be carved into the stone itself, uh, but that is uh, symbolizing that they joined the organization uh, which was created to be able to build um, uh, old folks homes, old soldiers homes for the remaining members of the army. Um, the Confederate stones were peaked at the top and they had uh, the Confederate States of America um, uh, flag next to them possibly or carved on them, but uh, it's the Southern Cross of Honor and they had a story, um, don't know if it's true, but I've always heard that the Confederate stones were peaked at the top because they didn't want the damn Yankees sitting on them. Then we get to the Spanish-American War and they're very similar to the Union stones and most of the wars after are also very similar. It's the rounded top because um, we are a one nation now, so all of our military stones are going to be the same. Um, but the Spanish-American War also has a similar shield um, and you'll see again, Spanish-American War usually on it, so you can tell. Um, also look at your dates. Um, Revolutionary War, obviously we don't have a lot of these in our uh, cemeteries here in Arizona. Um, in fact, we don't have, probably have any uh, because we weren't a state at the time of the Revolutionary War. Um, and we were a, a part of Mexico, I believe. Um, we might've been Spain at that time. I'll get my history straight here. Um, but anyway, Revolutionary War uh, burials you'll see in all other parts of the country. Um, and these are some of the things you might see. These are some very interesting ones that um, I thought I would mention. Um, the veterans, uh, you've got the uh, seven, 1776 on it, or it'll say veteran on it, um, or it'll have the Latin. Um, the shield is very similar to what they ended up using for the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, this is uh, on the left is actually what they call a true daughter. So she was an actual daughter of someone that fought in the Revolutionary War, not just what the daughters of the American Revolution, what we call ourselves. She was a true daughter. Um, she uh, would have been a, a daughter of someone who served and they gave her a plaque later in uh, later on in years, the daughters of the American the Daughters of the American Revolution organization would have placed this on the marker of someone who was a daughter of someone who fought in the Re Revolutionary War. Likewise, on the right is this is um, the deceased actually served in the Revolutionary War and was recognized by the Sons of the American Revolution, another lineage society, as uh, someone who served as a veteran or as a patriot. So fraternal organizations, there's a ton of these guys too. Um, these were secret or very not secret um, societies of brothers and sisters. Uh, many of the fraternal organizations had a sister uh, organization for the women. Um, a lot of them are defunct today, but some of them do still exist. And a lot of the acronyms that you're going to see on tombstones are going to be fraternal organizations. And I like to tell people, if you don't know what you're looking at, 
go look up some fraternal organizations because more than likely whatever that Latin phrase is or whatever the three letters are or whatever has to do with a fraternal organization. Um, these organizations were instrumental in the death industry because a lot of them were the first to offer some kind of death benefit to their members, either uh, providing a headstone for them or providing a funeral for them or other things. So it was kind of like an early form of insurance um, because otherwise people sometimes couldn't afford a burial for their loved ones. The Woodman of the World, um, this is the one that I talked a little bit about with the limestone marker. Um, they tend to carve a lot. This is a marble example, but um, the Woodmen of the World were really one of the most popular. So you're going to see a lot of these, and a lot of times you're going to see them as a piece that uh, carved to look like a piece of wood. Um, they are still active today, and they were one of the first to offer this death benefit, and it included a tombstone. So most folks had a nice tombstone if they were a member. Um, eventually, they came more of like a became more of like a club or a group. Um, a lot of the woodmen of the world were also members of things like the Freemasons or the Knights of Pythias. So you're going to get a lot of different people that were members of multiple organizations. Um, their motto that you see here, the Doom Tacit Clamat, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, but I don't speak Latin anymore. It's been a long time. Um, and it means though silent, he speaks. So sort of the gone but not forgotten idea that we have today. Um, the dove and the olive branch and the axe all symbolize workmanship and the progress of culture, which was part of uh, what they stood for. Um, there was also a female component. The Masons, uh, we talked a little bit about them earlier, and they're probably the most popular and the one that most folks know about because of popular media and things like that. Um, they their symbol is the square and the compass inside the G, which either means God or geometry. Um, sometimes they've got clasped hands, like we saw a little in another one. Uh, sometimes it won't necessarily mean that it's the hand bringing the wife or another person to heaven. It could just be clasped hands for one man, um, indicating that he's shaking hands with God um, or that he was a Mason. Um, they were committed to intellectual pursuits. And their symbol represents the progression of material intellect and spiritual pursuits. Um, you're also going to see, I've only got the, the compass and the G here, but you'll also see uh, sometimes the all-seeing eye, which we get on the dollar bill. That's not very common here in Arizona. It is in other parts of the country, but we don't see a lot of that symbol. It's mostly this one. And the Knights of Pythias. Uh, so the Knights of Pythias are... Um, their symbol is a heraldic shield and a suit of armor that you can kind of see in this photo. And the letters CFB stand for Charity, Friendship, and Benevolence, which was their motto. Um, they also had the largest number of symbols. So that was just one of many that they used. So I like to think that if you can't figure out something, try KFP first because it's probably them since they have so many choices to pick from for their members. Um, and it also could tell you something about what organization, uh, what local branch they may have belonged to, because perhaps one part particular lodge preferred a, a symbol over another. Um, so that could be a clue also. Uh, they were a secret society of government clerks. Pythias was actually the misspelling of a path Pythagorean, I'll get that right, philosopher named Fintius. Now, don't say that five times fast. Um, he was actually put to, get, to death by di the god Dionysus, and he didn't show up for his death date, but his friend did. Well, Dionysus um, was so impressed when Pythias, um, Fintius actually did show up. Uh, Dionysus was so impressed that his friend had such loyalty for him that they, he spared both of them. So they used this as their motto, and they um, butchered his name rightly so, because it's all difficult to say, especially with braces. So um, I like that story. I think it's great. And I like the the symbols that they use. And I like that there's so many of them because it, it really makes researching fun. Another one that I'm going to talk about is the Fraternal Order of Eagles. They were originally called the Order of Good Things, and they were a theater group. Um, 
they were a brotherhood, but they also provided the death benefit of a funeral. So their motto was that no um, brother and no eagle will ever go unburied or buried in a potter's field. Um, they also were the fathers of Mother's Day, which um, they petitioned to have mothers recognized for all the work that they do. And so they are considered the fathers of modern Mother's Day. The one on the right is the Improved Order of Redmen, and this is one that is not very common. It's more common in California. I'm not sure if you've got any in Nevada, um, but it's the Improved Order of Redmen, and Totem of the Eagle is what that T-O-T-E stands for. Um, they were a secret society that was founded even before the Revolutionary War. Um, they were there to perpetuate the legends and traditions of a vanishing race, and keep alive its customs, ceremonies, and philosophies. And unfortunately, um, but until recently, they didn't allow actual um, Native Americans to join their organization. So they are still around, um, and I believe that they are allowing all folks to join their organization these days. But I thought this was a definite, a beautiful stone um, and an interesting story behind it. There are thousands more, but I'm going to skip to animals in the interest of time. We all love animals. Animals can sometimes just be because you loved that particular animal and it means nothing else other than it was for this example. Maybe he just liked horses and this was his horse that he had on here. Or maybe he was a, um, uh, he had horses or he was a farmer. Um, he had a ranch. Uh, we have a lot of, of, uh, horse uh, memorabilia in our state. Um, anyway, so it could mean something or it could not. It could just mean that they liked horses. Uh, you never know. But this uh, also means uh, horses had a lot of different meanings. So they meant magical powers. Uh, they were represented good and evil. If you have color on your stone, a good horse would be a white one, a bad horse or good would be represented by a white horse, bad would be uh, represented by a black horse. Um, they could bring life or they could bring death. So they're kind of quite a um, conundrum there. They represented fire or they represented water or in the Bible, they represented lust. So you could think all kinds of things about George Phelps here and and um, until you dig into him a little bit more, I don't know the, I don't know whether he was just a horseman or if he had something else going on. Beehives, we saw some uh, beehives on, and some acorns on a couple of the other stones that we were talking about. The beehive actually, uh, and the acorn, which I'll talk about next, um, are, they both symbolize um, greatness from nothing. So greatness from humble beginnings or you were um, rags to riches kind of story and acorns also are the same story. Uh, li lions. Uh, lions, obviously, um, in a lot of different ways, we talk about their courage, their majesty, majesty, their strength. They were the guardians of tombstones. Um, they also symbolized God and the, and the resurrection. Um, so the one on the left is actually a dog. It's supposed to be a dog. It looks more like a seal. Um, somebody need a little more uh, time with carving, but that is supposed to be a dog. And dogs, obviously man's best friend. They symbolized fidelity and loyalty and vigilance. So they could be guarding the tomb like the lion, or they could be a man's best friend. Uh, there could be a dog buried there. There's so many different meanings for dogs. Um, you can also go back to mythology with Cerberus guarding the, the underworld, um, or Anubis, the Egyptian god. I mean, the, the dog on the left kind of looks a little Anubis-like. Um, he was also an Egyptian god of the underworld. And he was depicted with the head of a dog. Books. We've already kind of talked a little bit about books, but um, the one on the left is an open book. Um, and an open book means that they are open to God. Um, and you even get the, the verse there, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. That is uh, typical for an open book. Um, it can also represent the Bible. Um, it can also mean that they're registering the name of the dead 
and sending it to heaven. So that's kind of what you have on the right there. The book is open, um, but it's bookmarked because the life was cut short and their name was registered in the book of the dead and the hand is sending it up to heaven. Again, this is another open book, um, book of the dead, possibly the Bible. It rests on a pillow, uh, which is pretty nice nicely done in this particular stone um and again it could be the life cut short because it's open in the center uh it's hard to tell if there's a bookmark um but it's uh definitely registering the the life in the book of the dead because it rests on a pillow plants and trees so we can talk a little bit about that there's a ton of those um i'm not going to talk about all of them i don't have one of roses but that's pretty a common rose um, and that's another one that's common on children's stones. Um, if you have a bud, a rose bud, that could be the life cut short of a child. Um, but if it's blooming, then they were uh, had a full life. Um, but I don't have any pictures of the roses, but those are fairly common. Um, again, on the left is another woodman of the world. Uh, you can see the symbol up here. Um, and it looks like a tree stump. That's usually my first guess if I see a tree stump. I'm going to look first to see if they were a member of the Woodmen of the World um, organization, but it could also mean just that a life was cut short, uh, like you see on the right. Uh, it's just a very simple log. Uh, life was cut short. They weren't finished living. Um, if you look at the death dates, mother and daughter uh, died the same day, so probably some sort of a tragedy happened there, and this is how they were, they wanted to remember them. Uh, these could also be bought from Sears and um, ordered and, and sent to wherever. So these were also a good, um, you'll see a lot of them. Flowers, uh, the one on the left, the lily, um, or it's the same stone. So it's the lily. Innocence, purity, virginity, uh, God's grace, spring, renewal. Um, the spirit is reborn from death. It's a very popular plant that you'll see a lot on women uh, because of, of what it represents. And, and women are the spring and the, the beautiful flowers and things like that in the past. Um, like I said, the acorn, uh, greatness from humble beginnings. Um, the one on the left here is a pillow again. It's called a bolster marker. Um, it's got some leaves on it. Ivy leaves are usually representative of immortality, love, eternal love, friendship, or the idea of gone but not forgotten again. So you've got some ivy leaves here. Um, the laurel wreath, um, the wreath on the left, sorry, I couldn't find a better one. I had to zoom in on one that I had. It's victory over death um, and a circle with no end. Um, the laurel leaves typically are used for wreaths, and even without a wreath, the laurel leaf will be that victory over death like we saw with some of the angels and the half laurel wreath um, was a symbol of the god apollo who was a god of knowledge um the god of poetry the arts healing herds and flocks all things that could symbolize something that was important to the deceased person so it doesn't always mean um something victory over death but it could mean that plus they were uh part of another uh, uh, something else was influencing that memorial. Pyramids, I'll just talk about that because we have uh, a few here in Arizona. Um, several of our prominent early settlers are buried here. We've got uh, the one on the left is in Tombstone. He was a prospector um, and Tombstone was founded by him, uh, Ed Shifflin. The one in the center is our first governor of Phoenix. He was governor forever. Uh, George Hunt, um, and he wanted to be buried um, in Hunt's tomb. Uh, and uh, the one on the right is uh, Poston. He was the father of Arizona. He lobbied for Arizona um, to become a territory uh, separate from New Mexico, and that is a burial in Florence, Arizona. But the pyramids are exactly what you would think. They all come from Egyptian mythology, uh, going towards heaven, things like that. Um, but most of the time it has some kind of reference back to Egyptian mythology. Urns. There's a lot of um, information or a lot of meaning in urns. Um, the draped urn, whether um, whether there's a, a drape on it or not, sometimes this is considered the veil between heaven and earth. 
the draped urn usually does mean um, that, but it could also just be reverence towards the deceased. Um, the urn is a form of reverence. Uh, the one on the left does not have fringe on the veil, so it just uh, could also mean that the person was shedding their earthly garments to rise to heaven. The one on the right, you can kind of see um, there's a little bit of, there's some fringe here, some stuff hanging off of it. That does rep uh, represent the veil between heaven and earth. Um, this again is uh, the laurel laurel wreath around the urn, and this is mourning and re um, eternal remembrance, the symbol of the urn. Some more laurel on the left. Uh, the one on the right is an urn with flame, and that is eternal remembrance. Again, the eternal flame, the flame lasts eternal. Um, and it also represents religious fervor. So perhaps this person was a very religious person. Uh, this is the broken urn, which uh, indicates that this person died in old age. Uh, they made it a long, a long life. And these are not my photos, but I love these. These are some of my favorites that you've seen, probably photoshopped in the center, but these are fun. And I like to look for fun things like this um, when I'm in cemeteries. I like to see what's the funniest thing you can find on a cemetery. And uh, we've got whole PowerPoints of some of these hilarious ones. So thank you all. Here's some references if you want. Um, since this is being recorded, it'll be added there. Um, I can print them out and send them to uh, Dr. Malek if you'd like so that you can have them. But these are the two books that I use. Um, both of them are wonderful. Uh, Douglas Keister's book was printed um, first and uh, Tui Snyder uses a lot of his stuff in there, but they're great references to have in your collection. Um, and these are the ones that I always go to when someone asks me if I know of a particular symbol. Tui Snyder, if you go to her website, she also has some handouts I mentioned throughout here. Um, on hands and crosses, and those are great for trying to decipher what you're looking at. And uh, both of them have other books too that are really good. Um, and then just some information on if you'd like to join the Association for Gravestone Studies. I do not think we have a Nevada chapter. It may be us because we are also the only chapter for California. Um, there's a Colorado chapter, I think, that just formed, but if you're interested in, in more information, just shoot me an email. Um, I manage our email, so, uh, or go to the main website, thegravestonestudies.org, and if you have any interest in, in, or if you're coming to Arizona and you want to visit our oldest Phoenix cemetery, give us a, a chat or an email at our Pioneer Cemetery Association. And that's all I've got for you. Thank you, Jennifer. My gosh, that was great. Um, actually, the whole time you were showing a lot of these symbols, I was thinking exactly of all my ancestors' uh, markers, who so many of these are on. So I learned a lot about my own ancestors' uh, uh, markers as well today. So this was wonderful. Oh, so, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up to the class. And, and class, if you have a question, please unmute your microphone, but leave your camera off and ask Jennifer your question. Okay. Yes, I, I have a question. Sure. Um, yeah, um, I spent about uh, almost 20 years in Alaska. And one of the main uh, grave markers that I saw up there was a cross with three bars on it. Uh, normally known, at least up there, as the Russian Orthodox Church or the uh, just the Orthodox Church. And I didn't see any of those in your presentation. I actually cut that out. So I, I do have one. I'm going to flip through my notes. Um, I do have one. Uh, sometimes they're the um, the way the Wayfarer, I believe, uh, cross because they give directions um, to for, from the deceased person that um, that they're going. But yes, the the Russian Orthodox cross is also common. We don't have a lot well, of them here. Well, actually. Yeah, actually, when I was living there, and I learned from the Ruth Russian Orthodox Church that those three three bars had definite meaning. Uh, the very top one was the one that was placed over Jesus when he was on the crucifix, okay. and it said King of the Jews. Um, the lower one that was slanted 
um, had two meanings. One was Son of God, and the other one was the foot the footrest for Jesus. And oh, I was just surprised okay. I didn't see one there. That's interesting. I had not heard the the Son of God and the foot footrest of God because what I had heard is that the bottom the slanted kind of one at the bottom, it was a place for travelers to stop and pray. So that's interesting. But like I said, there's so many meanings to different people of, of different religions. So that's awesome. I didn't know that. Thank you. Sure. And Jennifer, could you put that last slide up with the two books? Uh, some, somebody in the chat room would like to take a picture of that. You got it. Let me, can I, there we go. Thank you. You're welcome. And any other questions? Anybody learn today uh, about their own ancestor stones, what the meaning on their on their stones were? Yeah, I learned that mine must have been very poor. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some they, of those too. <laughs> they could have been super poor or they could have just uh the time has taken the stones away or made them <laughs> or you know a lot of our early uh, people, uh, pilgrims, a lot of our early folks here in Arizona um, used just a stone um, and we have no record. You know, we, we say there's not a lot of burials here in Arizona, even though we know there's tons um, just because they used natural things that wore away or somebody used it for something else. You just never know over time. But yeah, um, I've got so many ancestors that there's no cemetery anymore. Um, there's my seventh great grandfather, um, where he was buried. There's photos of his stone in the 1950s, I believe, but nobody seems to know where it went after that. So I've got a book that somebody at least took a photo and put it in and there's, it, it's gone. I have no idea. They say that there's some kind of pasture over where his farm was, but, um, I don't know. Yeah, it's that's the sad part. <laughs> you know, Jennifer, I've got a couple on my dad's side of those folks, of those folk homemade stones. <laughs> um, so that was that kind of really shed a little bit of light on mine because I was thinking, I, I never really thought about categorizing them as a folk stone. I, I just kind of looked at it and went, oh, my, they must not have had a lot of money and they just made a homemade stone. Yeah, I mean, it could be either that or maybe that was, meant more to them than buying it out of the Sears and Roebuck catalog. Yeah, the one that I'm thinking of actually looks like they took a stick and they just wrote the guy's name on the cement. <laughs> or maybe they didn't like him. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> that might be more symbolic. <laughs> okay, class, another an opportunity to, to ask Jennifer your, your questions on your ancestor stones or anything in the presentation? Give it a few seconds here. Uh, Jennifer, okay. I, I wanna okay. thank you for the information you gave me on the Van Horn tombstone. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I, let me know, I mean, or, or let Dr. Malik know and uh, <laughs> she can let me know. That would be great. I, I'm curious to see what you find out. Well, I probably won't do any more research on it because my understanding is that the records for the cemetery are lost. Okay, yeah. And so, uh, but I just needed confirmation that what my instincts were telling me. Yeah, I think you're right. Thank okay, you. Well, Jennifer, Jennifer if, there's, if there's no more other questions from the class, um, I'll say thank you uh, so much for a wonderful presentation and for your time. And uh, also, thank you for allowing us to record today. And it will take our marketing department a few weeks to get it up on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, but I'll let you know when it is up and ready to go. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. And, and I'll just invite the class to stay for the next half of class for the next couple hours. We're going to be working on our family trees. Uh, if you'd like to leave us at this point in time, all you'd have to do is click on the red end button. And uh, we will see you next week. But if you'd like to stay, we'd love to have you stay for the second half of class.